There's so much to do, more than we can possibly squeeze into a 24 hour day or even a seven day week. How can we get it all done? Do you ever feel like you're fighting against the clock, constantly in a hurry, whipsawed from one activity to another, just trying to keep your head above water? But what if it doesn't have to be this way? What if your life, your pace, the way you show up in the world, what if it can all be different? The truth is, God designed it to be different. God has a better rhythm in mind, a more joyful and life-giving rhythm. It's called Sabbath. Sabbath not just as one day a week, but as a way of life, as an orientation of the heart. Good morning. It is a delight to be here again. Um, I, oftentimes, Mark and I, we have the wonderful joy of sitting in uh, the congregation with you all. Today, I have the wonderful privilege of sharing the word with you today. When I looked at the um, bulletin, I have to tell you, my heart did a little bit of a flip. And the reason for that is because I studied Psalm 90, but on the bulletin it says Isaiah and Mark. So we're just going to trust that the Lord's got the battle, and we're going to trust that he's in the story. And so I invite you all to sit and be present in whatever way you need to be. Because I want to declare this truth, that the Lord is here. That the Lord was here during the week, preparing this space for each one of you. No matter where you find yourself today, The Lord was here this morning, preparing the space as worship team was preparing for this service. And the Lord will remain here and prepare this space to meet with you again next week Sunday. But I want to tell you that the Lord does not stay here in spite of the fact that he is here. Because he goes with each one of you. Wherever you find yourself in the highways and the byways of life this week. And so today, today is about dwelling according to Psalm 90. Today is about pondering the brevity of life. Today, truthfully, is about trusting God with his message and his word for today, for each of you. Now, I'm going to tell you that um, this psalm is a prayer this psalm was penned, this prayer was penned by Moses. That's interesting, is it not? Moses in the book of Psalm. Interesting. Now, you will notice that there's not much on the screen other than that. And there will not be much on the screen, quite truthfully. And my prayer is that you will soon find out why. So if you would, join me in prayer before we tap into what it is that the Lord wants us 
to experience through his word. Pray with me, if you would, please. Lord God, I am so thankful that, um, that you are here. I am so thankful that your spirit invades every single part of this building, whether it is in the sanctuary here, whether it is in the fellowship hall, whether it is in the foyer, whether it is in the individual classrooms, your spirit invades this space and fills it up. God, I give you thanks and praise that when we open your word, we come face to face with you. No matter where it is that we're reading in the day. So God, I just trust you with this morning. I trust you with the now. I trust you with the future. For you have been trustworthy in the past. So fill our hearts with what it is that you want us to experience today. I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have been looking at different types of Sabbath practices for the last five weeks. So we've had opportunity to practice. We've had opportunity to begin to adopt ways of being with the Lord and in our day. Wherever we find ourselves. Quite truthfully, Psalm 90 is an interesting psalm. Like I said, it's a prayer. Moses prayed this prayer. This prayer, Moses prayed while wandering, wandering in the wilderness. I believe that this prayer, when you look at the historical setting of it, Moses, as he is praying this prayer and as he has penned this prayer, could be mourning the death of his sister. It's based on Numbers 20. I invite you to go and read that chapter sometime this week. It'll give you a sense of what Moses is feeling in the wilderness as he continues to wander. So his sister Miriam has died. I'm sure front and center for Moses as well is the sin of Moses striking the rock in the wilderness which is what kept him from entering the promised land and also as Moses is penning this prayer I'm sure he is mourning the death of his brother Aaron so like I said, it is not necessarily an easy psalm to read. Oftentimes we go to the psalms and we want to receive the comfort and we want to receive the solace and we want to receive the strength and we want to receive rest. But this psalm doesn't necessarily do that for us. In fact, it, it, it brings into our mind and might even Mm, probably provoke a little bit of anxiety in us when we realize that Moses is speaking about the brevity of life. In fact, it is about our own mortality. And there is no place than a funeral where we begin to realize and think about our own life and the mortality. And our own mortality. Even as Christians, even as believers, even as those of us who have this assurance of eternal life, still can be anxious about the reality that we aren't always going to be here on this earth. I don't mean for it to be depressing. 
but it is real and what better place to be real than in the presence of the Lord and we are dwelling there today simply so I invite you as we begin to look at Psalm 90 to sit to listen carefully for what the Lord has for you today so Psalm 90 hear the word of the Lord once again it's a prayer Moses penned this prayer Lord you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God you turn us back to dust and say turn back you mortals for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past or like a watch in the night you sweep them away they are like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning in the morning it flourishes and is renewed in the evening it fades and withers you are consumed by your anger by your wrath we are overwhelmed you have set our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your countenance for all of our days pass away under your wrath our years come to an end like a sigh the days of our life are 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong even then their span is only toil and trouble they are soon gone and we fly away who considers the power of your anger your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you so teach us teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart turn O Lord how long have compassion on your servants satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like I said, it's not an easy psalm to read. Not when you hear the words wrath. Not when you hear the words anger. Not when you hear the words iniquities and secret sins. Not when we hear the words you turn us back to dust. We experience the reality, as I said, of our own mortality. And as we hear the, ang the words of anger and the words of wrath, we might even be, what might be stirred up in us is maybe feelings of guilt. When we hear the words, our iniquities, our secret sins, we might truly be filled with shame. Satan loves this. Satan loves it nothing more for us to hold on to our guilt. Satan loves nothing more than for us to hold on to shame. Because those things can and do keep people from dwelling in the presence of the Lord. Many of the people that I do ministry to, they experience and feel a lot of guilt. They feel a lot of shame. And what's been so amazing is that they will say, Pastor Deb, I never... I never experienced the love of God in such a way because I felt so shamed. I felt so shameful. I felt so guilty because am I part of the problem? And so they stay away. And so they don't dwell in the presence of the Lord. 
I wonder how we all are doing with our Sabbath practices. Because when we, when we do Sabbath, that is what we're doing. We're introducing a new type of rhythm. And that rhythm is about slowing down. That rhythm is about being present. That rhythm is about dwelling with the Lord. And when we hang on to, on to, yes, we are guilty. We are guilty because we are sinful people. But we heard the gospel story in the songs that we sang this morning. So our guilt has been paid for. We do live under the judgment of God, hence the reason for our brevity of life. But we heard the gospel in the songs that we sang this morning. Because what we deserve, Jesus already paid. Have you ever, so I, I think what I want to focus on is I, I, I uh, looked at verse 12, where it says, so teach us, teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Teach us to count. Have you ever noticed as we go throughout life how often we number things? Like for instance, tonight. Tonight is the big Super Bowl game. And this is number 57 for the Super Bowl game between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. Do we have Eagles in the room? Do we have Chiefs in the room? Hey, hey, y'all are dwelling together. That's good. A lot of times our local will mark day number 100 in the school year. Some of us may number the steps that we take in a day. Mark and I, we are marking our 40th birthday, number four, uh, no, our 40th anniversary. We both marked our 40th birthday. I will be honest about that. But this is our 40th anniversary coming up this summer, and we are marking. How many of you farmers out there talk about the number of bushels per acre that you've harvested any given harvest season? And do you realize that all of us receive a number the moment that we are born? It's called the Avatar score. I'm sure none of you were aware that that was being done to you when you were first born, but you are being examined. Your heart rate is being checked. Your respirations are being checked. Your muscle tone is being checked. Your response to stimuli and the color of your skin is all being checked and given a number, and you want to be the perfect 10. Trust me on that. When I was a nurse, I did a lot of APGAR scores. So even... The moment that we draw our first breath, we are receiving a number. Numbers are like what fill our day. It's about quotas and inventory and appointments. It's about watching the clock to make sure that I don't go past 10 o'clock. It's like they run our day. So how do we count our days? I like how the uh, NLT translates it. It goes like this. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Teach us. Teach us. So it's learned. It's learned. We don't just think about and ponder every day that we're one day closer to our death. So it's about being taught. How many of you, when you woke up this morning, thought that this might be your final day? I didn't. I didn't. Because it's not a typical thought for us, is it? And that's okay. But as we think about the brevity of life, I invite us also to recognize that each day that we are given is truly a gift. Each day that we are given, we are given an opportunity to live with intention. 
each day that we are given, we are given an opportunity to live doing the will of him. Who's you know, Jesus, Jesus, his life was, was very short. On earth, I should say. His days were numbered. He came to live among us knowing that. And you know, Jesus, he is so intentional about everything that he does. He's okay with, with any kind of an interruption. You know, like in fact, if you look at Mark 2, which is the scripture that was, one of the scriptures that was on the front of the bulletin, you will, you will see that it is um, the story of Jesus going into the synagogue. Jesus first actually walking um, through the field of grain and the uh, disciples and he picking some grain on the Sabbath. Also, you will see how Jesus comes into the synagogue and there is this man with a withered hand. And he is intentional about calling him out, calling him forward, and healing to that hand. He is intentional. And there's a beautiful story in John 4 where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And they have this really amazing conversation. And his disciples have gone off to the, to the little village to go gather some food. And when they come back, they, they offer food to Jesus. And Jesus says, well, no, I'm not really hungry. And they said, well, what? Where did you find food? But this is what he says. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. That is Jesus' will. His days are numbered. He's intentional because he is here to do the will of him who sent him and to complete it. So how are we taught? How are we taught? Well, Moses starts this prayer so beautifully. He brings the focus to the Lord because that's the only place he could bring it, to the Lord. He is wandering in this wilderness. He had his eyes and his heart set on the promised land and he knows something different. And then he reminds himself, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. It's not like the Lord is like a whisper. It's not like the Lord is the grass that's renewed in the morning and then fades and withers. No. He brings himself to the dwelling place of the Lord. For he knows that the Lord is was, is, and always will be. He is everlasting. But he recognizes the need to dwell in God, to dwell in the Lord who is before the world was even formed. It is about everlasting, like this way ancient thought that none of us can even begin to grasp. That is how mighty and eternal our Lord is. And then it's about the Lord who is on into the future that we cannot even imagine. To dwell with this Lord. He reminds himself that the Lord is from generation to generation. Generation to generation, stable. Generation to generation, dependable. Generation to generation, eternally constant. See, generations of people pass away, but the Lord eternal does not. Such a dwelling is sure. God is our dwelling place. Have you thought about yourselves personally, but also as a faith community? Generation to generation, 
the Lord has been stable. The Lord has been dependable. The Lord has been eternally constant amongst this church in this community. Generation to generation. Just like the children last night, you are impacting the next generation in this generation. Thanks be to God. Because who is to say, as Amanda said, you have no idea the stories of some of the, of the children who were present last night. And yet, who is to say that there was not a word or there was not a thought or there was not a touch or a smile that told them something so different than what they might know or hear at home or out in their community or in their classrooms in school? You brought Christ to them. The world needs to hear it. Trust me on that. The world needs to hear it over and over and over again because the noise of the world is so different. The noise of the world is so different. Bring the sound of Christ into that noise so that they feel comfort, so that they feel valued, so that they know that they are seen and that they are known by you folks, by us, by Christ, most importantly. So dwell. And that's where our teaching begins, as we dwell with the Lord. So practice numbering your days by dwelling. That dwelling place is foundational. It's like this launch pad. The launch pad that is underneath us, securing our lives. In fact, Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful text. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. We have a little grandson who's expecting a little baby brother or sister. They don't know what it's going to be. And we had him over for a few days this past week, and he says to grandpa and grandma, he says, baby, arms up high rock yeah that's dwelling is it not is it not arms up high the foundation so that baby feels secure and that baby feels loved and that baby feels welcomed and accepted this is a place where we can find our refuge and our protection where we can bring every single one of our sins and truly be authentic and real because you know what? The Lord knows every single one of our sins, the ones that are visible as well as the ones that we keep secret. It tells us this in the scripture today because sometimes there are sins that we do keep secret from one another. But we don't have to as we dwell in the presence of the Lord. So we cease from striving Bring all of who we are into this dwelling place because we do not enter. This place that we enter is not an empty space. It is not an empty space. So we cease and change our rhythm as we dwell to be fully present with the one who is fully present with us, with you and with me. And it is then we begin in this place where we can begin to grasp the brevity of life as we dwell with God who is from everlasting to everlasting for he is the only one who satisfies. He is the only one who satisfies. And as we dwell and are fully present we are trusting God with our life that day rather than trusting our life to the productivity of work of activity, of noise, of the world. Now I want to say this, good news, the brevity of life is, is not a curse. It is a blessing. It's like, wait a minute, what in the world? What are you saying about that? Well, I want to take us back to Genesis for just a moment. You know, in Genesis 3, we have, you know, where Adam and Eve has eaten of the fruit, sin is introduced, 
Keep reading in the chapter. You see a beautiful way of where God comes looking for Adam and Eve. And fear and shame, guilt, have separated them from God and caused them to hide. And God keeps walking and calling out to them, where are you? Where are you? But they have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So their eyes have been opened to something that was so totally different. But you know, God created us to be flourishing people and in this relationship with him. And as you continue reading the chapter, we soon see where the people, Adam and Eve, tried to clothe themselves. But God takes the life of an animal, sheds the blood, and clothes them with animal skins, which is more durable, more permanent. And then God says, you know, because they have eaten of this tree of knowledge, who's to say that they might not eat from the tree of eternal life? So he says, we, they need, we need to get them out. Because this life is full of toil and trouble, as we read in, our, in the Psalms. And God says, no, I do not want my people to live in toil and trouble. Sometimes we see that as a curse, that, oh my goodness, God, what are you doing? You are removing them from this most beautiful garden. But he does not want us to live eternally in this type of toil and trouble. Praise God for that. That's why I say the brevity of life is a blessing and not a curse. So we are finite. God is infinite. We are not promised another day, but we are in this day, which is a gift from God. And in this day, we have an opportunity to serve God with all of our hearts. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, there's this beautiful story. It's called Lunch with God, and I want to finish it out with this today. So a little boy, he wanted to see God. But he knew that it was going to be a long trip. So he... And he decides to pack... A six-pack of root beer. Whoops! And he also decides to pack Twinkies. Nothing better than root beer and Twinkies together. And he says, this journey. Because he knows that it's a long journey to God. But he's prepared. So he sets off. He's got his backpack and he's walking along. And quite truthfully, he gets about three blocks from home and he sees this old woman sitting over here on this bench. This little boy is a little tired. So he decides to sit by, down by this old woman. And this old woman is just watching pigeons. But she's sitting there. So he sits down. And you know, he decides he's just a little bit thirsty. So... He takes out his root beer. I'm going to take this one because this one is a little easier. So he takes out this root beer. And he takes a drink from it. I'm not going to open it, though. <laughs> Even though I would like to. <laughs> and he takes a drink from it. But then he noticed that the old woman looked hungry. So what he does is takes his Twinkie box out. And he opens it up. And he offers her a Twinkie. He offers her this Twinkie. She is so grateful she accepts it, and she smiles at him. Well, her smile was so pretty 
that the boy wanted to see it again. So he offers her a root beer. And again, she smiles at him. And this little boy is just delighted. Well, they sit there all afternoon, eating and smiling. They never said a word. As it grew dark, the boy began to realize how tired he was, and he got up to leave. But before he had gone more than a few steps, he turns around and he gives her a big, big, And she gives him the biggest smile ever. When the boy opened the door to his own house a short time later, his mother was surprised by the look of joy on his face. She asked him, what did you do today that made you so happy? He replied, I had lunch with God. But before his mother could respond, he added, and you know what? She has the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Well, meanwhile, the old woman, radiant with joy, returned to her home. And her son was stunned by the look of peace on her face and asked, Mother, what did you do today that made you so happy? She replied, I ate Twinkies in the park with God. Before her son responded, she added, You know, he's much younger than I expected. Too often, we underestimate the power of a touch, the power of a smile, the power of a kind word, the power of a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the powerful potential to turn a life around. Remember, we don't know what God will look like. And people come into our lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. So cultivate. Cultivate an intimate relationship with God. Make yourself available. Give your time to God. Give thanks to God for each breath that you have, each moment that you are given, for those two are gifts from God. Be intentional, be observant, be okay with interruptions that then cultivate an opportunity for us to bring Christ to others. So I invite you, who's crossing your path? Pay attention. Who's in your classroom that might need to have a smile or a touch or a hello? Who's in the checkout line? Who's in this sanctuary that might need all of those as well? Remember, our lives are brief. God is from everlasting to everlasting. And he gives us an opportunity to bring Christ so that others may know Christ on and on and on from generation to generation to generation. Especially as we wait and as we continue on our journey. Until we reach our home where God will be among mortals. Where he will then wipe every single tear from their eyes and where we can say, glory, hallelujah, death will be no more. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Pray with me, please, if you would. Lord God, we are so thankful for, for this space where we could just dwell. Dwell in your word. Dwell in your presence. Dwell with you. This space is not absent of you. God, give us opportunity. Give us eyes to hear, ears to hear, ears to hear and eyes to see. You at work and your invitation to us to join you where you are. 
I pray this in your strong name alone. Amen.